The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Morningstar IM, ABN 54071808501, AFSL 228986, and Alan Gray Australia Proprietary Limited, ABN 48112316168, AFSL 298487, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial financial advice or services, or endorse any general advice. If a PDS, TMD, or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. These documents can be found on the investment manager's website. The responsible entity and issuer of units is Alan Gray Australia Balanced Fund, ARSN 615-145-974. Alan Gray Australia Equity Fund, ARSN 117-746-666. Alan Gray Australia Stable Fund, ARSN 149-681-774. Equity Trustees Limited, ABN 46004031298, AFSL 2409.75. Past performance is not a reliable indicator of future performance, and there are risks with investing. How are you now, and welcome to the Ensemble Investment Podcast. My name is James Whelan, Managing Director of Barclay PS Capital's Wealth Management Team, and I'm here to represent you, the humble advisor, doing their best to walk the line between client interests and asset class selection. We're trying to find the things that are not only appropriate, but that are actually working to be in the right things at the right time, the right way for the right clients. So get set because myself and Morningstar are going to do our absolute best to answer some of the questions that have come up on the Ensemble platform. All information contained is general in nature. So here we go. Morningstar Investment Management Australia is delighted to be sponsoring Ensemble's investment podcast series designed to equip advisors to have more meaningful conversations with clients. Morningstar Investment Management is a global leader in asset allocation, investment research and portfolio construction. Specialising in investing, behavioural coaching and practice optimization. Morningstar strives to give advisors the tools to confidently navigate their clients' complex needs. Morningstar, empowering investor success. At Alan Gray, our philosophy is simple. We take a contrarian approach, apply it consistently, and invest for the long term. To outperform the market over the long term, we recognize that you can't invest in the same way as everyone else and expect a better result. As contrarians, we thrive by not following the crowd. We resist trends and uncover opportunities in areas we believe may have been overlooked or are undervalued. It's a unique approach that brings true portfolio diversification and the opportunity to outperform. Speak to our Alan Gray team today or go to alangray.com.au for more information. How are you now and welcome to the Ensemble Investment Podcast brought to you by Morningstar. My name is James Wheeler, Managing Director, Barclay Pierce Capital's Wealth Management Team, and I'm here to represent you, the humble advisor, doing their best to walk the line between client interests and asset class selection. We're trying to find the things that are not only appropriate, but also work and maybe try and find the right time to be the right weight for the right clients, the most important part. So get set because myself and Morningstar are going to do our best to answer some of the questions that have come up on the Ensemble platform. And obviously, all information contained is general in nature. So here we go. Volatility. Now, it's finally come to this. To paraphrase Obi-Wan, it's what gives a portfolio manager his power. It surrounds us. It penetrates us. It binds the galaxy together. It doesn't actually. But let's be honest, it does get a little overhyped at times. And in fact, that hype is the basis for my own personal theory of thing, which is that once you can have the most volatile event in the world and it can suddenly become near meaningless purely because it has been talked about so much. So the biggest events suddenly become small and the smallest events are the ones that you don't expect so much. Hence, volatility is important to portfolios. Or is it? And how I'm, I'm going to go on with it. I could talk all day on that one. We have some real volatility in front of us and the financial media is loving the panic that they can cause the markets and do cause the markets. Also, every rent-seeking bedroom economist on Twitter loves the volatility that's ahead of us as well and always will talk about it more than it needs to be talked about. So we need someone to help us cut through some of this and find the wheat and the chaff and figure out where you need to be. We need a multi-asset portfolio manager and we need a fundy that specializes in long-termism and volatility ignorance, if you'll excuse the expression. I couldn't ask for better, two better heads on this one than Bianca Rose, portfolio manager at Morningstar and Chris Hestelo, senior investment specialist at Alan Gray. Bianca, how are you now? Yeah, great. Thank you for having me. Welcome back. And Chris, first time out here. How are you now? Yeah, very well, thanks, James. Thanks for having me too. I do apologise for the t for the uh, expression volatility ignorance. Is that is that, is that who I, I don't know if that's... I don't know if I'd characterise it by that. I'm just certainly not offended. But I think uh, 
I think we maybe think about it in almost the opposite way. So where others may uh, get scared of volatility, we kind of live in a topsy-turvy world where we start to get excited uh, and look for opportunities in those kind of environments. Well, before we go down that, that, that road, Chris, everyone gets the same question when they come on here. What do you do and how do you make money? Sure. So my role is, as you said, senior investment specialist. So I wear a few hats. Uh, probably one of the main one is keeping the market and our investors abreast of what we're doing with the portfolio. Uh, but then I also play a number of roles looking after asset consultants, ratings houses, uh, a little bit of project and product work too. So a few different hats. Uh, the second one, how we make money. Uh, so that's really based on our, well, everything we do is underpinned by our three pillar investment philosophy, which is contrarian, long term and fundamental. So what does that mean? A contrarian, we look for opportunities where others are afraid or potentially running for the exits. Love it. Uh, we like to lean into those or, or search out opportunities where others are scared because we think that's the best opportunity to find a mispricing that has occurred and something that's trading cheaper than it should be. Uh, the fundamental aspect, you know, any any business is uh, its value is the future cash flows it will generate for us as owners, discounted to today. So that's what we focus on. Mm -hmm. We don't focus much or we intentionally don't employ macroeconomists or try and pick the timing or magnitude of macroeconomic trends and events. We just simply don't think we have an edge in that. So we like to focus at the individual business level and think like business owners. Uh, and finally, the last component is that long-term element. So we think patience can be a, a real competitive advantage in markets uh, where there does seem to be potentially even an increasing trend towards short-termism. Uh, and so we like to take a longer time horizon when we purchase a business. We don't look for catalysts. We're happy to hold them if we continue to see fundamental value there. Very good. Great intro. And Bianca, obviously, this is not your first radio, but just to remind people um, your specialties. Yeah, so I'm a multi-asset portfolio manager um, and also I do do some external manager selection and I will just say we do have Alan Gray, uh, Aussie Equities, in, uh, as one of our managers. I'm on the record as being a big fan of Alan Gray as well, so it's it's a, a, we're all pointing in the same direction. It's nice you're, to be amongst friends. You're amongst friends here, so no, it's, it's all right. Yeah, but go, sorry, Bian, go on. No, that's all right. Um, so, yeah, so we also look to take advantage of market volatility, um, you know, as a multi-asset portfolio manager. Um, and, yeah, we do use that time horizon arbitrage to sort of try to look through the noise. Time horizon arbitrage is one that we're going to come back to later on. Um, I've got a whole bunch of questions that are here in front of in front of me with regards to volatility. But did we just want to, want to talk about what – I mean, it's – I can't really the, – the, the fact is that we – that we're not looking at what's going on around the world specifically because it theoretically doesn't really affect what you're seeing. Bianca, I'm going to start with you on this one. Big picture stuff that's going on at the moment. How is it changing the vol on the portfolios? How is it changing the tilt on the portfolios? What's ahead? I mean, we've it's, we are recording this podcast pre-election. I'll, I'll I'll say that that's <laughs> that, yeah. that's as much of a thing. Everything that everything that's being talked about is yeah. that there's there's some, there's obviously. It's a generic throwaway. You could be any particular part of the last 20 years and maybe the next 20 years when you could say there's tensions in the Middle East as well. Um, and that's obviously changing a few things as well. What, yes. what sort of things on the horizon do you have? Uh, so, yeah, so obviously we're aware of, you know, the, you know, elections coming up in the US. We're aware of a lot of, um, you know, heightened scrutiny on the Fed and whether they're going to, you know, tonight, you know, reduce interest rates, are they not? Um, you know, inflation outlook, cost of living pressures, all of those things. But where we we are probably not looking to do is we don't look to predict where that's going. So we're not looking to predict tonight is the Fed going to cut interest rates or not. What we're aware of though is what is the market pricing in, right. and so we kind of are very aware of these factors to know what is the market worried about, what is it not worried about. Um, and to sort of identify things that where we think has got a little bit overboard, if you like. Um, so that's kind of where we sit on all of these kind of uh, different, you know, whether it be um, geopolitical tensions as well. Um, you talked about Middle East. There's also obviously US and China situation. Um, but so we need just kind of aware of those things. Yeah, and uh, I'm just sort of thinking. Let's just get straight to it because we did mention before. There's a there's a, a report that we did want to talk about on this one. If, if we just start talking about that now, then I think that we're going to get some good flow off the back of of, of where it is that we're, that we're talking. And then I'm going to get to the questions that's in here. So the Mind the Gap report, Bianca. Yes. Now, we've, we've, you've mentioned this to me before. Yeah. Do you want to run us through what the Mind the Gap report is? So this is a Morningstar report. 
Yes, Can and we just- come out every year with it. Yeah. Um, so what it is is really it's uh, about uh, looking at the gap between a client's returns and the fund funds or strategies returns. Good. And what we find constantly is because people are not contrarian by nature, they tend to chase returns and then they choose usually sell out under underperformance. They tend to experience um, lower returns than what the fund may have of, over the same time horizon. And I guess if you look at the very latest report, on average, it's about a percent difference okay. annually um, between the returns, which is quite a bit of a difference. And we can talk a bit more. But in particular, I guess um, the more volatile strategies um, tend to have the higher gaps. So that average figure of one percent is a bit higher than that. You know, nearer to two for for more um, kind of highly volatile strategies, and a bit less for say, let's say, multi asset um, rebalance typically, you know, periodically kind of strategies, which might be only about half a percent. Yeah. Chris, now are you familiar with this report? Yes. And uh, I have uh, been grateful for it. I've quoted it a few times in client presentations and the like. We're going to make sure that we get a link to it as well on the the platform too. I mean, I I think it's really interesting. You know, (laughs) the difficult thing is that we have evolved to not be great investors, I think. And so, you know, if people lent in during times of volatility, they didn't get scared, you'd You'd expect in that Morningstar report the investor return to be greater than the asset's long-term return. Uh, But unfortunately, on average, we get it wrong and we destroy value. And it mainly is due to those behavioral biases and those fears. You know, typically the emotional impetus is greatest to sell uh, when something has sold off and we feel safest purchasing something uh, when it's breaking all-time highs. Uh, And to do well, you really start to need to think in the opposite way. We've evolved to do this because historically it's always been risky to be the one out on your own. Uh, if we think of the caveman or back in caveman times. Very good. If everyone's sleeping inside the cave and there's one contrarian who decides to go get some fresh air and wants to sleep out under the stars, uh, he or her is very likely the one that gets eaten. And so we've evolved to follow the wisdom of the crowd, to run away from danger and uh, discomfort um, but in investing, those kind of emotional uh, drivers can have very negative impacts on our end results. Yep. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was I was I was reminded of, and the the best metaphor that I have for that is uh, I was watching one of those David Attenborough documentaries. There's a mongoose and squirrels. I think the mongoose eats squirrels. I'm sure it was a mongoose. Anyway, what it was, there was there was two trees, and there was one squirrel that was in one tree, and there was a a, a couple of squirrels in the other tree. They were a partner, you know, married couple, whatever. It, you know what I mean? Mm. And the one, it was effectively just a choice between the two, and it chose the one that was on its own. So it is it is dangerous to be out on their own, professionally speaking as well, because people want to keep their jobs. It's just easier to hug the index. How do you how do you respond to it's easier just to hug the index and just go, if it goes down, at least you're going down with everyone together, and you can report to clients that, hey, the market's down, but we're all down together. How, 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 does, how does the Alan Gray philosophy mm. counter that? Yeah, I think it's helpful how our business is set up for a start. Uh, So we are privately owned. We're not listed. We think a contrarian approach wouldn't work well in an environment where you had to get up, you know, at an AGM and explain what you're going to do over the short term to turn things around after a period (laughs) That would be a nightmare. Underperformance. Having owners who deeply understand what we do and what the approach is uh, really helps. Uh, The way that over time we have educated our clients to understand our approach really helps. Um, we often see the same behavior of our clients that we do, which is, uh, you know, everyone goes through periods of underperformance. We often see our own clients leaning in during those periods of time because mm-hmm. they know that when a sell-off occurs, that's the best opportunities to pick up bargains. Yep. Now, Bianca, uh, I've got a theory and, and it's taken me a long time for me to become this sort of investor as well and this sort of advisor and also running a business that that, that, that does this sort of thing now as well. I did... Uh, just like all young people, you, you get sort of distracted with the short-termism. You see a thing that's in there. Bloomberg is saying that this is going to happen. We need to alter portfolios and make a change and, and, and sell. They ease off a little. I realize now that 99.99% of the time, just being bullish is is almost always the right way to go and just being invested and staying invested, making very small tilts here and there based on certain things that come out potentially from Morningstar are, are usually the best way of going about it. How do you... How do you how do you know which one is the one time that you need to be doing something a little bit bigger than just the smallest thing? So I think it comes back to cash flows, you know, and I guess to Chris's point at, at the very outset, we kind of try to think what's fundamentally changed. 
And if we think, you know, whether it be a short-term geopolitical tension or so on, and if it doesn't really change the long-term cash flows, then, you know, we kind of say, okay, that's just a short-term thing yep. and there's an opportunity there for us. Um, so I think we always come back to fundamentals. And at, to your point, most of the time, a lot of the, um, I guess, short-term things don't really affect the long-term fundamentals. Yep. Yeah. Um, what sort of things would affect the cash flows? So I'd, I'd take, for example, one of the big volatility events we have coming up is, is going to be the US election. If there is a huge tax change that's in that regard, that would that would affect the cash flows of companies. It will. Yep. The, the, the tricky part is for us, I guess, is we can't predict that. We don't have an edge yep. predicting um, government policy. So probably we are more kind of interested in maybe what do we think um, might happen in terms of concentration of industries or things like that that might change in the future. Mm -hmm. So we do kind of consider things, but more from a longer term perspective, does this change policy from a long term perspective? Because it's really difficult to say, okay, in the short term, we think the tax change is going to be positive or negative or um, you know, when I think of even, you know, um, the different candidates that we have at the moment, some are going to be more favorable to renewables and utilities. Some are going to be less favorable. Some are going to be, um, more favorable to U.S. industries and, uh, less favorable to overseas industries. Um, those are the sorts of things that we kind of, you know, consider at the edges and we do kind of maybe change some of our fundamental forecasts, but they're not the big, you know, kind of movers. Let's talk about client conversations for, a while. I've had some very awkward conversations over my career. I've had some great conversations too. I, I don't fear either of those ones. What are the what are the standard responses, the caller responses that you would have with with your client conversations that you have at the institutional level or at, at the retail level? That potentially, Chris, or maybe you could fill us in on some of these ones that, that that you have when you've got something where someone is saying you need to get out, you need to do something, you need to change. The, the number of emails that I do get from clients, and a lot of the time it is, you are justified to have this response. I now need to talk to you through how there's a whole other alteration. There's a whole other universe that need, that exists that's outside of just what you're seeing right in front of you right now this week. Chris, what sort of conversations do you have there? Yeah, so it probably differs between a few of those client segments. Um, institutional, thankfully, we, we don't get too much of that. In fact, they're often the ones that are leaning in during those periods um, potentially, but we do have a large direct client book too. And so we often get phone calls in, uh, concerns during periods of volatility, uh, you know, it's good in that situation where they have an advisor because often the advisor can play that coaching role there and make sure there isn't an overreaction to the downside or uh, crystallizing losses during a negative market event. Yep. Uh, but I think what we generally tend to do is try to remain consistent with the messaging and with the information we're putting out there. Sometimes you can raise more alarm bells by firing off an uh, an email that's you've never done before during yeah. a big market sell off yeah. but if you have a, you know an ongoing monthly email that's going out or an ongoing quarterly email that is explaining what you're doing how you're positioned and what's happening uh, you're really taking investors along on that journey and we think that's a good approach yeah it's bianca difficult conversations yeah, so definitely um, in terms of short-term performance versus long-term performance, we kind of, I guess, um, again, we probably talk to both our institutional and retail clients about that um, long-term performance and put the short-term performance in the context of that. So for us, it's really about more consistency of messaging. So always um, when we try to have the you know conversations with our managers, we're not really starting with performance first. We're starting with their approach and why you own them. And so that kind of helps with that, our client conversations to say, okay, well, is the performance consistent with what we said the approach would be? Yes. Yep. And that always helps as our kind of North Star. Very good. All right. So moving on now, um, we've gone through the communication side of things uh, that advisors were keen to hear about. Uh, I've got here a question. The benefit of bottom-up bottom asset allocation and waiting for opportunities to present themselves. Does anyone want to speak to that bottom-up side? Yeah, sure. So um – this is probably a good question for us. We do run uh, a multi-asset portfolio as well. It's it's not what we're known for predominantly. Uh, most of the money we manage is in our Australian equity strategy. Mm. But we do manage uh, a multi-asset fund, which comes across as interesting to people because, as I said earlier, we don't employ macroeconomists. We're not trying to time those things. Yeah. So, and so in figuring that, out allocations would be based on... It, it's almost an organic outcome of the individual opportunities we're seeing across equity and fixed income markets. So cool. 
In that fund, every Australian equity, every global equity is bought at the individual security level, as is the case with all our fixed interest positioning. And so we're not looking from the top down and trying to predict what the asset class returns will be and make tweaks at that level. We're really looking at those individual businesses. And it's likely that if we're finding a lot of attractively priced companies, we will be overweight equities at a certain point in time and vice versa. If there's less fundamental value on offer, we're likely to be underweight. And that is the point at which we are now. Uh, So that fund is uh, baseline about 60% growth assets or Mm. equity assets. And at this point in time, we are around 55% uh, net equity exposure in the fund. And that's just due to the fact that uh, markets, especially in Australia and the US, are trading at quite a premium to where they have historically when you look at things like Ford PE multiples and the like. Yep. So difficult to keep pushing in on those particular valuations or are you waiting for some sort of a reset? Yeah, we just, uh, you know, we, we don't try and time a reset, but we just go where the value is. And at this point in time, Australia and the US as well into the top quarter, we have those markets breaking all-time highs. Luckily, we have a very wide opportunity set. So we are finding a number of opportunities across the globe, some cheaper price US businesses, businesses in Korea, um, businesses in Europe, but just remaining a little bit conservative at this point in time. If there was to be a market sell-off, and this is in no way a prediction, uh, but if there was to be, uh, that would allow us to put that you know dry powder to use and lean in. Yep. Um, Bianca, the, yep. Power of, the power of bottom-up investing? Yeah, so we do do some bottom-up investing, but I'd probably say we're in that middle layer, so we're not so we're interested in the macro factors other than knowing why it's impacting prices, but we probably are looking at um, you mentioned PEs and things like that. We will look that at that sector and regional levels. So we will look at countries um, from an equities point of view. We might look at credit markets in terms of spreads, and we will look at things in that kind of um, middle layer. And then we'll also do some bottom up analysis to sort of, um, I guess, triangulate that middle view that we're seeing. So if we're seeing Korean equities, for instance, looking interesting, we'll do some work on some of the big names there. You know, like you know Samsung, SK Hynix, that sort of thing. Um, so we do a bit of bottom up with middle kind of <laughs> level. And talking about just sort of the actual logistical internal internals at, at how it is, how does Korea then, how does it pop up on a radar? You know what I mean? How does it actually come to the fore of being something that is interesting? As you yeah. Say? So we have a capital markets research process um, where what we do is we look to build up returns and that's based on fundamentals. So we look at the PE, we look at the earnings yield. And we look at the trend growth yep. and we and also look at, um, I guess, margins and so on. And do we think they're over or under earning versus their kind of, um, I guess, steady state, if yep. you like. And that's kind of what we use as our tool to sort of filter where do we think the opportunities are and then we will kind of triangulate it with the bottom-up work as well. Okay. Actually, I've always been interested and, and speaking to a few sure. guys from Allegory over the times as well, it's just how does something actually pop up into someone says, someone says, look, I'm writing this on a whiteboard. I'm going to write this stock code on a whiteboard. Yeah, this is, and you know what? Okay, I'm I'm planting my flag on this particular thing. How does it? How does it run us through that little? So, look, we do have um, uh, internal quant tools and screening tools and the like, but it can often be simpler than that. For for us as contrarians, it can often just be a very negative news story or looking at the stocks that have done most poorly over the last six to twelve months. Uh, often that kind of thing can spark our interest, and then they kind of go through a, a phased research process. So you might spend a week or so just checking if this is an opportunity worth pursuing. And at any stage during these processes, the, the stock can fall out. Uh, but if it, if it is attractive, it can make it into that next round where the, uh, where the analyst might spend up to three months uh, researching the yeah. stock and looking into it and seeing if it's a viable uh, investment opportunity that's trading at a discount to fair value. Yeah, I have heard that it's quite thorough when it gets into the – to, to get to get through cull, it really has to be quite mm. thorough that's there. Now – there's hints of hints of active investing in that particular thing that you just mentioned there. I've got here the, the one of the questions from the advisor side: the power of active investing during times of volatility, and what history has told us about these times. Now, going active versus just sitting in the market. Now's the time to to justify your existence, Chris. I think so, but I think <laughs> I mean we find it with clients too. Sometimes I think the perception is that. You know, to be active in times of volatility, it's, you know, reacting when something happens, yeah. right? So there's been a sell-off and we sometimes, we also run a more conservative portfolio called the stable fund and sometimes there's a little bit of a misunderstanding or we have to educate clients because the perception there can be, you know, when something breaks, when something happens, you can go to cash. Uh, but generally, 
that's not the point at which you would want to do that, right? You don't want to be uh, looking after your gutters when it's already raining. You yeah. want to do the work beforehand and hopefully be appropriately placed, be appropriately diversified uh, before volatility hits um, because there's kind of a, a hierarchy of approach you could take when volatility occurs. Uh, at the bottom uh, would be, you know, selling out or panicking, which would be the least attractive option. The middle would be staying the course, which is a very good strategy. Um, but we think the best strategy can be uh, leaning in where there has been an overreaction in a particular asset or a particular company. Yep. Yeah. And I think that that's generally the theme for, I mean, yes, it's easy to say, it's much, much harder to do. And I think that that's why it's deferring it to a, to a, uh, to a manager to handle on there. I've, I've often heard that there's some funds that you want to own and have it in your portfolio that are just a good line as opposed to having a lot of different stocks that would look pretty ordinary on a portfolio, if you know what I mean. Mm. If you've got the, the, imagine the five best and the five worst stocks that are in, in an Alan Gray fund. Having those five worst stocks would look ordinary on a portfolio because they can often be quite an eyesore. Mm. But if you've just got that one line, it's not so bad. <laughs> it just says the Alan Gray Fund and it's on there, right? So but- I do get used by that. I mean, interestingly, yeah. some uh, stockbrokers and the like use us, which use very few managed funds. And yeah. it's because they don't really want to have the discussion around these hairy names uh, with their clients. And so that's what they employ Alan Gray to do. And all they see is the Alan Gray Australia Equity Fund. Uh, and not those underlying names, uh, which you know may have been in the headlines for the wrong reasons, or may have lost people a lot of money. Well, th- there you go. As much as I do love to talk about what's coming up ahead and what's going on into 2025, this with the, in the context of this podcast we're recording right now, it's not really a whole lot of point talking about it, just because we're just going to talk about how it just needs to be ignored and just as an opportunity <laughs> to lean back into the market. Bianca, so I, on that note, I've run out of notes. Um, I've run out of questions, everything like that. Bianca, is there anything else that I needed to, to mention that I completely forgot to do today? Uh, no, I think that that's pretty much it. It's it's probably just um, going back to my original point about the time horizon arbitrage. Yes. Oh, that's right. Time horizon. So really, yes. um, probably just that last point is is you know it's very much a behavioural bias thing that we think about. Um, Chris mentioned that that we just see it as um most of the market and especially even more these days is focused on that short term, and so um a lot of the managers that we employ and a lot of the opportunities that we personally also um invest in tend to kind of look longer term mm-hmm. to kind of uh, look for valuation um, and that's sort of how we get there. That's fantastic. Chris, last words? Yeah, I think I'd agree with that. I mean, the the only thing I'd say was, you know, I wouldn't say we're completely ignorant at the macro side and it's very interesting to talk about, of course, but I think what you need to do is look at potential different future states of the world and what that might mean for the individual businesses. Mm-hmm. So, of course, we can't predict what might happen with interest rates I think there's uh, a decision coming up in the US, whether it's 25 or 50 bips is, I think, a coin flip at the moment in terms of futures pricing. Uh, But what we can do is we can think about the individual businesses we own, how much debt they have, and what that might mean uh, for the potential future cash flows of those businesses. Yes. So you're right. You're right. Sort of an if function. If it is this, then it will create this sort of situation. Then we can, then we can move. Try to, try to game it. Ahead of time, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Don't make big bets on on things that are terrifically difficult to predict. Um, but think about what that may mean for yeah. the individual investment opportunities you're yeah. you're looking at. Which then means, and and long term is the best way to sort of just. Well, I'm going to open up a whole the cans of well talking about how much priced in everything is all the time. Doesn't matter what it is you're talking about on this one. Thank you for joining us, Bianca Rose, portfolio manager at Morningstar, and I'm going to get this right, Chris Hestelow. Senior Investment Specialist at Alan Gray. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, James. Thanks so much for having us. And this has been a, an Ensemble Investment Podcast. Don't forget to get onto the Ensemble platform. We're going to make sure that we've got that Mind the Gap report on there um, so that people can pick it up. I think it's public, Bianca. Yes. Yeah. And um, and we're going to go through that. So thank you for joining us. Brought to you by Morningstar. This has been another Ensemble Investment Podcast. My name is James Whelan, Managing Director of the Barclay Fairs Capital's Wealth Management Team. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.